Okay, good morning. Parashat Metzora today. Thank you for joining us so close to the upcoming Pesach holiday. Today's class is dedicated in loving memory of Zelda Bat Nissel Vedivare, whose your site is on the 10th of Nissan by her granddaughter, Helen Rosenfeld. Thank you, Helen. Um, I'd also like to take a minute and uh, thank many of you who have um, gotten together with Gail Peltzer and Sarah Towell and uh, sent me a beautiful uh, gift for Purim, um, a monetary gift and a gift for my daughter and son-in-law's new baby, Vivian. So I thank you for all the gifts and for my grandchildren's gifts. So again, thanks to everybody. It's very, very heartfelt and um, appreciate it. Let's get started right away in Parashat Metzora. Uh, most of the work we're going to do is Pesach related, but since the Varyom Beyomo, each day has to be celebrated for its, in its proper time, I would like to touch on Parashat Metzora and see how it speaks to our Pesach holiday. These parashiot very often coincide with Pesach time. So if you'll open your Humashim, Sefer Vayikra, chapter 14, Hashem speaks to Moshe saying in verse 1, Zot Tihye Torah HaMetzora, page 620. This is going to be the Torah of the Metzora. The Metzora is one who has contracted a disease. The disease is some type of a skin, um, some type of uh, tzara'at is sometimes defined as leprosy, but it's not that, it's not bacterial, it's more of a attack on, it starts on the house, on the clothing, and then actually could be on the person. It's a way for a person to recognize that they need to change their ways. Mitzora sounds like motzi shemra. So many people say that it is as a result of having um, spoken um, badly, lashon hara. Specifically, they say that because Miriam gets this contract, this disease, after her having spoken with Aharon, possibly about Moshe Otsipora. Regardless, the second pasuk says, this is the Torah of the Metzora, beyom taharato, on the day that he becomes um, purified. Vehuva el hakohen. So we've been discussing the idea of the impurity and what it causes people to do. And in today's context of exile and redemption of the Yom Kippur, of the Yom Kippur, as a holiday, I'd like to start to think along the lines of exiles and redemptions. The Metzora has been exiled. He's been excluded, isolated, and estranged. He's been outside the camp and away from his home and away from his family. It's as much of an exile as we could uh, imagine. And what's happening now in the beginning of Al Perashah is it says, that the el hakohen, that the person who had a disease, he was not in a good spiritual place, he was not at ease, and therefore he contracted this physical malady. Vehuva el hakohen, he's brought to the kohen. But then the next verse says something very beautiful, and this is what I want to use so that we can get in, set the tone for our Pesach prep. Even though the one who was afflicted is being brought to the Kohen, what is the Kohen doing? It's actually very beautiful. It's a beautiful education. My mother will say all the time, don't wait for the guest to come all the way to your front door open the door and go out and greet them and draw them in and pull them in. This is what's taking place here. Ve'yatsaha kohen, the kohen, the one who is ohev shalom, who is rodev shalom, the one who loves peace, who chases after peace, 
How do we treat the person who's been excluded? How do we treat the outsider? What's the first thing we say at our seder? Anybody who is hungry, please come and join us. And hungry doesn't just mean that they haven't had a meal or food to eat. People can be hungry in a variety of ways. Hungry means sometimes they're hungry for attention or hungry for love, emotionally, financially, physically. They need aid. Anybody who is dikhbin, anybody who is in need, what's a beautiful, just looking at the beginning of Mitzorah, the Kohen himself, the epitome of holy is going to go out and extend himself and go greet who? The person who was at one point the epitome of unholy. So it doesn't matter how high you are on your perch and how low the person who is coming towards you is, the education the Torah tells us is you get off your throne and you go out and you meet them and you come to their level. That's how you bring people in. That's how we embrace people. This of course is going to be very much the stage that we're gonna to set to see the prototype of Moshe Rabbeinu, his personality and what it takes to be a redeemer and what it takes to be redeemed. And what's beautiful about the way the parasha um, lays itself out right at the beginning is imagine the person who's been excluded. And you know, we think it's a seven day process, but if you didn't learn your lesson and you didn't get it right, it could have been a longer, it could be 40 days, it could be a year. There's no limit to the time that you could be out and uh, um, isolated. <clears throat> What the Torah wants to make us sensitive to is the longer the person is isolated, the more he's going to need assistance. Vehuva means he is brought. You could picture him being escorted. It's as if he has bodyguards, as if he has people standing next to him to hold him up, to bring him back. So in the one sense, the person who needs the help needs help just to come back into the fold. And recognizing that, says the Torah, the Kohen is going to leave his holy Mikdash and go, he's going to go all the way to the place where that person was. So it's a very, very beautiful visual. And then we see these words, and the Kohen is going to see the healing process is prefaced with the word vehine. And we know vehine means it's divinely ordained. There's been an intervention from above. Vehine nirpa means the healing process is always going to be connected to having a connection to Hashem. And that is how we're going to introduce our um, coming off of the tzara'at uh, disease and malady. Look, everybody wants to take the first train out of Tazriya and Metzora. Anything we could do to get away from the oozing and the lesions and the skins and the boils, nobody wants to talk about that stuff. But there's a lot of relevance for today's day and age. And I'm just going to add one last pasuk because it's right here and I hate to leave it behind. Verse four tells us how it is that the one who was afflicted is going to become pure again. And the ingredients that are used, the tools that are used are in etz, it is, is going to be a cedar tree, wood from the tallest tree. And it's going to be tied together with a zov, with hyssop, with zatad, with the lowest shrub. And I think these visuals show us that God is saying, I'm tying together the tallest tree and the shortest bush so that we could understand that nobody is beyond these uh, um, conditions. And maybe it's also a sense of, in order for us to have this redemption, to be, come back, to go back to our homes, today we're talking about the leper who needs, or the mitzora who needs to go back to his personal home, but when we're going to talk about Pesach, we're going to talk about as a nation, how are we going to get back to our home? 
And I think there's a very beautiful uh, visual here. How are we going to get back home? When we could tie together the cedar and the hyssop, when we could as a nation be balanced, when the people on the highest rungs of any category, whether it's intelligence, whether it's wealth, whether it's physical strength, whatever it might be, when those people who are the strongest are gonna tie themselves to whom? To the weaker members in society, to the zatats, to the hyssop, to the small bushes. When we can tie together both uh, um, prototypes, that's how we're going to have a redemption. So these are just visuals to take us to where I'd like to go today. Here in Metzora, the afflicted is going to have his redemption and he's going to go back home and he's going to be taken out of his exile. And these are some of the methodologies. The methodology is first and foremost, he has to be willing to be brought to the Kohen. And it's beautiful because it says to people who need healing, who are in a place where they, they are so weak that they don't know themselves what is going to bring them to a place of redemption. Sometimes all you have to do is allow yourself to be helped. And once you allow yourself to be helped in the next verse, the help does come. And on a national level, how is the help going to be something that is uh, sustainable? Is every member of the society, because I may be strong in one thing, but I may be weak in another. And so we have to tie together our weak and our strong. And as individuals, we have to tie together our strong suits with our weak suits. We have to allow for our strengths to compensate for our weaknesses. We can't just see ourselves as hyssops we have to remind ourselves that we also have cedar within us. So we need to integrate personally, we need to integrate as a nation, and that will take us, God willing, to a full redemption. I'd like to start now in addressing the upcoming Purim, ha I keep saying Purim, Pesach holiday. I'd like to actually start in the beginning of the book of Shemot, and I think it's very interesting now to note some words that tie to our perasha as well. It's on page 292. It's the book of Shemot, chapter one, verse one. I'm going to focus on the last word of that verse. It starts with, these are the names of the children of Yisrael. Ele Shemot b'nei Yisrael haba'im mitzrayma et Yaakov ish u'beto ba'u very important to focus on the progression of how we got into Egypt, because Egypt is going to be an exile, but it's just going to be the blueprint of future exiles. Meaning, when we go into Egypt, how did we get there? Ish ubeto, we came with our homes, Coming with your home means coming with your family, coming with your culture, coming with your foods, coming with your family, coming with a sense of familiarity. The first step of an exile, the first place where a person is looking is back to their original homeland. Ish ubeto, they came, you could picture them literally as if they were carrying maybe even their physical homes with them. We bring a taste of home with us. We're still attached to our origins. But what happens in exile? Again, this is telling us about our story today. We had seen it in Yosef, how he named his sons. When he names his son Menashe. And the first reason he names his son Menashe is because what's on his mind? Nashani Elohim God has helped me forget, but what is he forgetting? My father's house and my torture. So in forgetting your father's house and your torture, what you're really doing by naming your kid after your hometown is you're remembering it. Even if you're remembering it as a place of pain, the first generation or the first phase of an exile still has an attachment to the original homeland. 
And it goes and it names here in our perasha, I mean, the book of Shemot, the first chapter, it goes to name all the children. And it says, Vayamot Yosef, Yosef dies, that entire generation dies, and B'nai Israel they proliferate. We have these words in our Haggadah, Paru vayishretzu vayirbu vayatzmu bimod meod batemaleh aretz otam. These words are taken directly from here. Because what does happen in our new land, when we have a host country and we're feeling like the past is behind us, we want to build a new life in this country. But in verse eight, things go south very quickly. As long as we see ourselves as guests, as long as we're still looking back at our hometown, we have one status. But the minute that we turn and we start to say, and you'll see in verse nine, a new king comes up and he tells his people, Hine am b'nei Yisrael. Am is a derogatory um, way to describe a nation. They're an am. And you know what they are? They are rav ve'atsum mimenu. I apologize if you've heard this already, but I think it's the key, and I think it's meant to be repeated every single year at this time. What is Paro's problem with us? Is it the census that our population has exploded? Is that his problem? Because that would could describe that we are rav, is his problem that we are strong? Because that would describe the atsum, the otsem, the strength that we have. So now we have a people who is strong and there's a gazillion of us. But was that really his problem? Do you know how the propaganda spread in Egypt and how it spreads in every single host country that we are ever in? It's not that we're Rav. And it's not that we're atzum. It's the word mimenu. We're not just greater and stronger than them. Mimenu, says Paro. You know their strength, their buildings, their homes, their cars, their fields, their orchards. Mimenu. Everything that they have is what? From us, is taken from us. That's how the propaganda begins. Because how could you dehumanize an entire population? And how could you take, and very often is the case, that the perpetrators of the genocides are cultured people. They have intelligence. They know the sciences. They are philosophers. How do you take those people and turn them into an army of murderers? That's what happens. How does that happen? They have to tell them it's a matter of survival. It's us or it's them. This is the Mein Kampf of the days of Egypt. The, these are the booklets that are circulating in Egypt. And what's being said by the host country is, you see those Jewish people? You see them? What they have is Mimenu. What they have is from us. They took it from us. So it's only fair that we go and take it back. And that's how they mobilize the troops. And we need to be aware of them and of that. And they say in verse 10, Havan it hakemalo. This is in our Haggadah also. Let's outsmart them. Pen yirbe, otherwise they may become so great that if there should happen to be a war, they may team up with our enemy and fight against us. Another propaganda 101 is a hypothetical situation that's going to inject fear and terror in the people. And how do you terrorize people? You let them know that unless they incinerate us, that they themselves are going to become victims. So it becomes a habal somebody's gonna come to kill you. You actually have a right, you have an obligation 
for self-defense and to protect yourself. This is this is right here in our Chumash. It's thousands of years old, but it could be like it was written yesterday or today or tomorrow. And so these are words that we need to be aware of. I'll just read you a few more lines and then we'll take it to the next place. So they put on them in verse 11, Sademisim, taxes. How do you hurt the wealthy, the fortunate, the successful? You put misim, taxes on them so that you can, they could be tortured. And then they put them to build these cities for Paro, Pitom, and Ramses. And the crazy part is in verse 12, the more they try to torture, torture us, the more we proliferated. And what happens then is we become to them like vermin. We become something that is disgusting, something that is inhuman or, or unnatural. It's not natural for people. Wait, I am muted. It is exactly, we have to be sanitized. Yes, yes, yes. This is something that we have to be aware of. It's written here for us to be uh, totally cognizant of that exile, but this is a blueprint. And so what happens? They give them, and this is where I wanted to bring you for today. They torture them and they enslave them with parech. The word parech means back-breaking labor. What is the purpose of this back-breaking labor? The idea, the vayanu oto, the inui, leman anoto v'sivlotam, the word for pain and torture is the same word la'anot as to answer, to respond. And so many of anot, la'anot is to answer and inui, anot, is to torture. And so what did, their, did they want? They wanted their response or they wanted their expression to be one of pain and torture, but what they really wanted was to take away their ability to express themselves because they knew one thing. They knew that if we found our voice, whether it's our inner voice, our internal voice, or the one we use to speak to our God or to each other, if any of those bonds are unbroken, then we can't be broken. The way to break a people is to break their ability to express themselves, to silence them. And when you silence a person, now you have taken them and rendered them vulnerable and unable to defend themselves. This inui, this type of torture is exactly what we're gonna see as the story unfolds. I'd like you to notice today, I hadn't noticed it before, but now that we're looking at it through this prism, I'd like you to go to chapter two, verse 11. It's the top of page 298. And I know that I didn't take you through the entire birth of Moshe, which is a very fun and exciting story. Top of 298, the first line, it's chapter two, verse 11. In those days, Moshe. I know I left out the best part with him bobbing along in the Nile and the daughter of Pado finding him. But I wanted to bring you here because I wanted you to notice that this child who is born in this environment is a product of this upbringing, and I'll express it to you here. Vayigdal Moshe, Moshe grows up. Vayetze elechav, he goes out to his brothers. And the commentaries jump right in and say, well, which brothers? His Egyptian brothers or his Jewish brothers? Because since he was raised by an Egyptian princess, yet he was the child, the birth child of a Jewish woman, who are his brothers? He sees their suffering. And now it becomes very clear. He sees an Egyptian man in Ishmitzri hitting a Jewish man of his brothers. So how does Moshe identify? He's identifying here if he had to fill out his passport, he'd put his nationality as 
Jewish, because he's saying, Ish ivri mi echav, the Jewish man is his brother. But here's where it comes full circle. If Moshe is gonna identify as a Jew, and the plan of the Egyptians was to silence the Jew, look at the next verse and see what happens. He looks this way and that way. He sees ki en ish. A lot's been written up about, about this stuff. He sees that there isn't any man around. He hits the Egyptian and he buries him. What's missing from this verse? Moshe sees two people fighting where you don't use words, where words are not employed, you have war. It's war or it's words. It's diplomacy, it's peace talks, or it's fighting. Again, we see this every minute. And since Moshe is a brother to the people who have no voice, who can't express themselves, then what's his reaction? We, we saw it even more so, I, I don't want to be graphic, but Cain and Hevel, what happens in that story? Do they have a conversation? Hey, what spices did you put in your offering? Maybe I'll do the same and my offering will get accepted. Were there any words spoken? Was there a single conversation between Cain and Hevel? And no, there wasn't. And because there's no communication, this is how a society ends up uh, um, becoming dismantled. And here Moshe, as a brother to the Jewish people, he doesn't have words because they don't have words. It's not until the next day that maybe we think we see a ray of hope on the second day, I'm in verse 13, two men, two Jewish men are quarreling. And he says, these are his words. And he says to the Rasha that all of a sudden he decides which one is the aggressor and calls him the Rasha. And he uses these words. Lama echa. Could you tell me why you're hitting your friend? And the answer that comes back, Vayomer, is Mi simcha leish sar veshofet alenu. Excuse me, sir, but who died and made you king? Since when are you the boss of us? Since when are you a judge over us? What are you going to do? You're going to kill me the way you killed the Mitzri? And Moshe realizes very quickly that even when he tries to use words to diffuse a situation, they end up making things worse. He actually has to run away and become a fugitive. And now maybe we start to understand when Moshe is finally up on the mountain with the burning bush and God wants to tell Moshe to save his people, uh, we'll go one step at a time. So turn to page 302. It's chapter three. Oh, so it doesn't happen here. It happens in a Midrash. It's not actually in the text. The, coal, the question that's being asked is when does his speech become impaired because he reaches for the coal instead of the gold because right. Pharaoh thinks that he's stealing his crown and they want right. to show that he's just a little child that doesn't know one thing from the other. But that is all a midrash. It's intended to depict for us how he ended up. What, but it also is intended to depict to us that Pharaoh was onto him that Pharaoh recognized that he's going to be dethroned by this child who's tugging at his crown all day long. It's the Midrash Agada, which has a lot of um, uh, significance to it to fill in the blanks for us. Because otherwise, you're asking a beautiful question. How do we know that he has a speech impediment? And I'd like to say that I don't think that he needed 
um, uh, therapy. I don't think that he needed speech therapy. I'd like to suggest from today's class that not being an ish devarim could mean as well, I'm not a person who's able to express myself eloquently or um, in a successful way because, and I'd like to suggest that when he says it in this context where we are right now, when he tells God, Lo ish devarim anochi, I am not a man of speech, I think what he's saying is, I don't have the gift of communication. And you know why? Because I was never taught. I didn't go to Toastmasters. We didn't in the upbringing that we had with all the slaves and all the torture, the idea was to be silenced. If you keep your mouth shut, you'll stay out of trouble and you'll be okay and maybe you'll survive and you'll make it to the next round before we're liberated from this hell. And so what is Moshe saying? You want me to be a spokesperson and go speak to Pharaoh? How can I speak to Pharaoh when I can't even speak to my brothers? I try to say, excuse me, why are you hitting your brother? Maybe we could work this out. And where did that end up? I ended up in exile. I ended up in a double exile. I was already in exile in Mitzrayim. Now I end up doubly. I'm not even in my place of exile. I'm exiled from there to Midian. So Moshe is telling all of us, when he says lo ish devarim, he's saying something very profound. Do you want to be a redeemer? And do you want to be redeemed? You must become an ish devarim. You must become a person who knows how to uh, express yourself. Because if you're not going to express yourself, nobody's going to do it for you. There's a voice and an expression that's unique, bless you, and individual to each person. So even though we may have national spokespeople, if we want to be heard, and I don't, I'm going to take it way further than just, this is not just a, an, uh, uh, an idea so that we could be heard and people could hear our thoughts or hear our voice. This is not just about that. The stakes are way, way, way higher than just freedom of expression. I don't think we recognize how important it is until we go through these verses. And so as we go, I want you to notice, so if a person can't express themselves, you know what he asks God? When God tells him from verses seven to 11, let's say, I want you to take the people out. I heard their cries. I'm going to take them to a land flowing of milk and honey. And I see the torture that Mitzrayim is doing. So I'm going to send you to Pado to let my to tell him to let my people go. And you know what Moshe answers? Sir, yes, sir. At your service, here I go. None of that. We, you know what we get from Moshe? In verse 11, Moshe answers and he says, Mi Anochi. Who am I? Now, me anochi could mean a lot of things. It could mean me anochi, God, you're anochi. Didn't you say you are anochi Hashem Elohecha later on in the Ten Commandments? He's going to say anochi, it's the first commandment. So me anochi could mean, what are you looking at me for? Me anochi, God, you're the God. You take care of it. What are you sending me for? Or really what me anochi could mean is, I don't even know who I am. We said when you lose your ability to express yourself, you don't just lose your external voice, the one that everybody else could hear. You lose your internal voice, the one that speaks to you, the one that is your conscience, the one that is your guide, your Jiminy Cricket, call it what you want. If you don't express yourself externally, the next thing to go, it's like a muscle, it happens immediately. You don't have your inner cheerleader, the one who tells you, you got this, you can do it. You're strong, you're invincible, you're godly, you're powerful. That voice has been silenced as well to the point that what is Moshe telling God? First of all, you're speaking to God, you must be somebody. You must be a somebody if God is speaking to you. And what's your answer to God who's speaking to you? 
מי אנוכי? I have no idea who I am and what my אנוכי is. In Torah, when you see the word אנוכי, it means my purpose, my essence, my godliness that allows me to function in the world. מי אנוכי? Go through all the characters who have asked that question and you'll see that it's an existential question. It's the exist, it's the whole question that if I don't have an answer, I don't have an existence. That this is the whole question. And he says, who am I? And you know what God answers him? And I think this answer is so beautiful and so eloquent. God answers him at first in verse 12. He says, ki eheye imach. Uh, to me, it's, you don't get nicer or more generous than God saying, you think you're alone and you think you don't know who you are and you think you're a nobody. And this is what we have to tell ourselves every single day. Doesn't matter. Cause you're not nobody. You have God with you. And if you have God with you, you're not only a somebody, you're divine, you're godly, you're great, you're strong, you're powerful. The infinite is at your fingertips. This is what God is telling my mother smiling because she says, Hashem is with me. I'm with Hashem. Whatever we do, wherever we go, whatever the problem, it's not your problem. Hashem is with you. He can, if you can't handle it, don't worry. He can. And that's what God is telling us right here. It's these pesukim that are going to guide us from slavery to redemption. Sometimes the slavery isn't Egypt. Sometimes it's an internal inferno. Sometimes it's a place that we created, that only we know exists and we need to get out of there. And you know what God is saying? Not only Eheye, not only Eheye uh, Imach, I am with you. He tells us this next line. We have to take this and, 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 and etch it in our minds for always. Uh, hey, but he says, okay, but what if they ask me, what's the name of the God? You know what God calls himself? In verse 14, he says, uh, hey, yeah, I shed, uh, hey, yeah. you know who I am? I am, not just I am who I am. I will be for you what you will allow me to be for you. I will be what I can be to the extent that you embrace and tap into and open yourself to my presence, says God. I could only be as great and potential as you allow me to manifest myself. How godly you're going to be depends on how much of my power you're going to allow to let into you. That's what's happening here. It's not just speaking to Moshe, giving him a pep talk. It's giving every person who's going to be redeemed or a redeemer. And I'll say this, and I've said it, Moshe is just the prototype. He's the poster boy. I take back the word just because we can't say the word just with Moshe Rabbeinu. But Moshe's presence and persona and 80% of the Torah as the main character is intended for us to read through him ourselves, our lives, our challenges, and our journeys. And so Moshe thinks that he doesn't have the ability to speak. And what does he become? The greatest spokesperson of all time. He writes the book. He says, Lois Devarim. He writes the book called Devarim. That's his. He's the author of that sefer. So another thing that the Torah is telling us, whatever your deficit is, whatever your weakness is, whatever you think your handicap is, that is your ticket. That is your great gateway to your greatest accomplishments. It's through those difficulties that you have that you can become your greatest self. Vivian Hittery is in the house. Oh I love you. And she's throwing everybody a kiss. <laughs>
I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll bring her to the Zoom so you could all see her also. Um, okay, let's continue. So if Moshe is here to say, to tell us, um, not only does he say these words, he tells, but lo yishme but God, they won't listen to me. He has this, it's, I'm in verse one, chapter four at this point. He says, what's going to happen? They're not going to listen to me. I'd like to take you now and show you the progression and how Moshe grows, but it's not just for us to see Moshe's growth and to see the ability, how a person could go from they're not going to listen to me. They're not going to believe me. They're not going to hear me. I can't speak. They can't hear. Also, by the way, the minute you say, I can't speak, it now ends up projecting they can't hear. I didn't just pull myself down. I pulled down everybody else with me because I think I can't speak. I think you can't hear. And now I lose my faith in humanity. I lose my relationship with other people. It becomes very difficult. But I want to take you now to a beautiful um, place where Moshe really finds his voice. Because this, the whole idea of redemption is not just focusing on the deficits, on the handicaps. It's seeing how we actually could find, turn to um, chapter 32. Verse 32, it's page 500. We're still in the book of Shemot. So here we are at this point. I took you all the way to Parashat Kitisa, which is af the aftermath of the golden calf. We had the golden calf debacle. And what does God say? He says, you know something, Moshe? I am going to... Um, get rid of the entire nation and out of you says god i am going to make a nation i want you to meet moshe rabenu of page 500 because i want to make sure that we're aware that wherever we are there's so much potential for growth what does moshe answer when God says, and I may press the pause button before you answer, what does Moshe answer when God says, I'm going to destroy humanity, I'm going to destroy the Jewish people, and you, Moshe, I'm going to take you and repopulate the nation from you. What does it sound like? Where have we heard this before? Where has God said before? I'm going to destroy these exact words. I'm going to blot out the people with Noah. Beautiful. Same story with Noah. And here's where it gets so interesting. Noah, God told the same story to. And the story of, you want to say maybe the, the building that was done or the story of Lot that they're going to destroy Sedom. So I'm going to, I'm going to stick and she turns into a pillar of salt. So I, I'm going to stick for now with the story of Noah for one reason. And that is because the stakes are the same. God uses the same words. I'm going to blot them out. I am going to erase them. It's going to be as if they never existed. Now we have a tale. He promised he would never do that again to all of humanity. But now it's just the Jewish people. But still, for us to read this today, we're saying this is Noah 2.0 again. When we read about Noah, what does Noah do? And this is part of our story today. What does Noah, how does he respond when God says, I am going to bring a flood, start building an ark? What does Noah say? Nothing. Nothing. What does Noah say at any point along the way? 
Is he recorded as having a speaking part? The first time we hear Noah speak is after the flood when he's cursing his son Ham and his grandson Canaan. That's when we first hear Noah's voice, but that should speak volumes to us because when we come here in Parashat Kitisa and we see Moshe Rabbeinu, and he's faced with the same scenario. God says, step aside, I'm going to save you, and I'm going to destroy them. Do you know what Moshe says? You could, you could hug him. I, I, I want to say, you don't find these uh, ideals, but they are necessary for not only the redemption, but the survival of our nation. You know what Moshe says? Why don't you look at verse 32? God, if you're not going to forgive them, I want you to forgive them. But if you don't, don't erase them, erase me. I'm going to take the bullet. I'm going to take the fall. If you feel the need to use your eraser, God, then erase me. This is the person who didn't know how to speak up. This is the person who didn't know how to string three words together. What is he saying? What is Moshe Rabbeinu? He's not just saying this to God. He's saying that if you're going to be the leader of the Jewish people, if you're going to be a redeemer, then what do you have to do? You have to stand up for the people. You can't say... And now we understand a little better. I never understood the Noah. Why do they call him Ishadik? If you actually look at the beginning of Parashat Noah, it's pretty confusing to the reader because it's a very painful story to read. It happens to be in page 30 if you want to turn quickly, but save this page where we're on now, where it says, Ele toldot Noah, Noah ish tzadik tamim. How are we calling Page 30. How are we calling Noah and Isht, not only Tzadik, but Tamim, to perfection in his generation? And he walked at Ha Elohim Hit Halech Noah. He walked along with God. I'm picturing Noah as a giant walking on clouds, holding God's hand. That's how Pasuk 1 develops itself for us. It's not until we see Moshe's reaction that we understand what Noah being an Ish Sadiq means. You know what a Sadiq is? A man of tzedek, a man of righteousness, a man of justice, which means what? You know who was a little bit like Noah? They could have been very good friends. Yonah, Jonah, why? because he believed in justice also. And the truth of the matter is justice in the time of Noah, where it was Hamas, where the land was filled with uh, horribleness. What happens? In a land that's filled with Hamas, what's tzedek? What's just? They should be destroyed. That was Yonah's whole issue is that Nineveh was such bad people that they deserved to be destroyed. And he didn't want to go and give them an opportunity to make a teshuvah that he felt was going to be false or insincere and see them saved because that wouldn't be tzedek. People who are horrible people deserve to be destroyed, finished. And now maybe I understand for years it bothered me this Noah, he's not just Sadiq, he's Sadiq Tamim. In English, we might say to the letter of the law. To the letter of the law means that if something, somebody's deserving of something, then he's going to have it meted out to the full letter of the law. And you know what et ha Elohim et halech Noah finally means now? Now I understand what it means. He went along with God. God had a plan to destroy the people and Eta Elohim, Noah. And Noah went along. 
with God's decision to destroy. And therefore he says nothing. And I'm gonna take one more minute to describe this because I think it's very important. This is for us. What happens to a person when they don't use their ability to speak? When they don't speak up against humanity? I went one time, I forgot where, in the Holocaust Museum somewhere, there was that poem. They came for this one and I didn't say anything because I wasn't that. And then they came for the other one and I said nothing because I wasn't that. And then of course, what do they say? They came for me and there was nobody to, uh, to, to call out for me. I, I don't remember the author and I don't remember the exact poem, but it's a, it's a poem that spoke to the dangers of being silent. silent now, what, what'd you silent say? Is silence is a form of consent is what she's saying, which is very true. So I'm gonna just show you, Noah shows us a progression, not just for himself, but for us as well. He starts out on the highest rung. He is up there with the likes of the Adam, of the perfect man, the ideal man that was created. Oh, silence can be a punishment because they put you in solitary confinement. If you do it, even when you're walking around in solitary confinement, Wow, wow, wow. So something that's being said here uh, in the class is um, silence isn't just something that we are saying here. If you decide to stay silent, then you are either acquiescing or committing a crime. It's actually a form of punishment. When they put a person into solitary confinement, it's so they have nobody to communicate with. And I'm so glad you're saying that because when I was speaking of the highest rung that Noah started out on, the rung of Adam, of being a human in its greatest form, the human is called, the ability that he has is called communicative intelligence. This, I, this ability to communicate, in order to speak, what do you need in order to speak? You need, of course, your mouth and your tongue and all of that, but what else do you need? You need your lungs, right? The voice box, you need your brain, you have to formulate what you're gonna say, you need your heart to see how what you're gonna say is going to be formulated and processed. It's an entire bodily uh, coming together all your upper brain, your lower brain, all sides, your reasoning, you have to be creative in how you package it. Every part of your being has to be employed in order to uh, access this communicative intelligence as Adam. But, and you have to have a freedom and unchained. That's a beautiful word. And you need to be unchained to have this expression. So if the highest level, we're going to use Noah as our example. He starts out on the highest level. What's the next level? Living forms come in four categories. It's man at the top of the chain. And then you have the animal kingdom. And the animal kingdom has this internal and external ability to um, to move around to they they're they able to grow but Noah 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 exactly he spends so much time in the teva that maybe he starts to fall from the Adam kingdom he starts to spend a lot of time with the animals. Then the next kingdom is gonna be the plant kingdom. The plant kingdom has growth like the animal kingdom has, but the growth is rooted. He can't roam around like the animals. The animals could grow and move. He could only grow, but be firmly rooted. And how do we see this? What happens after he spends all the time with the animals and he slips a rung? What's the first thing he does is he plants a vineyard and he becomes one with those grapes. He literally becomes intoxicated. And then the last, the bottom of the um, developmental chain is the mineral world. 
the mineral world in Hebrew, I love, it's called the world of domim. Domim from the word demama, like vaidoma haron, silence. Because the mineral world, it doesn't move, it doesn't grow, it doesn't have roots, it doesn't have communicative intelligence, it doesn't have any of the other things. It's the bottom of the developmental chart. And what happens to Noah when he falls from his perch and he ends up with the animals and then he ends up like the grapes that he drinks and he becomes drunk, what, what does that render him? Domem, the word for silence, like vaidom Aaron, is dom. When when Yeshua wants to say shemesh begivon, dom. Dom means to be frozen, to be immobile, to not express, not do anything. So what is this vaidom? What is this world of demama? What is our fear? What's the possibility if we're not going to use our communicative intelligence? What could happen to us? We're going to become like a stone, like a mineral. We're not going to be able to. And what happens to Noah himself? Because he's lying like a stone, uh, literally stoned <laughs> because of all of the drinking, what happens to him? His son ends up committing, we're not going to go into the specifics today, but ends up committing all these heinous crimes and ends up, it's so terrible that Noah ends up having to use his language to do what? To formulate a curse, arur, to curse his own son and his own grandson. This is what happens. It's not to be taken lightly. So when we go back to our page, um, 500, where Moshe says, Mechenina misifrecha. He doesn't just say that, but in chapter 33, I want you to see now Moshe and his, when you use, let's put it in the positive. We saw with Noah what happens when you don't use your ability to speak and the gift and the potential that it brings. But what happens when you do? When you start out saying things like Moshe says, hey God, I'm going to challenge you now. You're going to erase, oh yeah? The first person you're going to erase is me. Erase me and I'll leave you all of them. But I am not going to stay alive if you're going to kill them. There's no room for me in a world. This is Moshe taking the strict letter of tzedek, of justice, and blending it with rachamim, with mercy, with kindness, with patience. Look what Moshe tells God. He says, listen, God, and I, to me, I, I, this is the whole said it in one sentence. God, finally, they make a deal. I'm in chapter 33 in verse 12. Moshe tells Hashem, listen, God. You told me to bring up these people. I brought up these people. And now, if I find favor in your eyes, I want to know your ways because I want you to, um, I want, I want to, we need to be together. This, this is not going to work because God at one point had said that he's going to send his angel before us. And Moshe is like, no, 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 it's not working for me. And God says, okay, my face will go and and I will bring you some type of, I'm sorry, I'm in verse 14. My presence will go with you and that will cause you peace and rest. This is what God is saying. And Moshe says, it's a no go, I don't accept. But the careful reader will see why Moshe rejects God's offer. Because he says, Panai yelechu vehachinoti lach. It's said in the singular. God is telling Moshe, I am going to bring you comfort. 
I am going to be with you. And what does Moshe counter in the next verse? Moshe in the next verse says, Im en panecha holchim al ta'aleinu mizeh. It's a package deal. It's all for one and it's one for all. And he says, otherwise, how will we know? imanu. You have to come with all of us. And God, when you're in the midst of all of us, veniflenu, we will all be um, meriting wonders and miracles. Ani ve'amecha. Let's be clear. Read the fine print, God. I'm not accepting this business where you come with me. It's all, it's one for all, and all, it's all for one and one for all. And, he's, and Moshe, at this point, is telling us, if you want to be a leader, not only is it not about just saving yourself, but it's about putting the other people first. You know, they say about Moshe, Ha'ish Moshe, Anav Mikol Adam. And we want to say, oh, Moshe was the most modest man. He wasn't the most modest man. Modesty from the word modus means to what? To restrain or to hold back. But modesty means that I'm holding back so that I could protect your ego. When I'm modest about something, it's that I'm hiding or minimizing what I am so that you could feel great about yourself. And that is Moshe, but better than that, there's a humility. And you know what humility is? Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. It's putting everybody else at the forefront. And what happens here is I want you to see the beautiful combination. Oh my gosh, it's 12 o'clock. I'm so sorry, I need three minutes. I didn't realize I got carried away. Okay, I'll be very fast. In page 506 on page 33, I just want you to see this because this is part of the redemption process. God comes and he puts Moshe in the cleft of the rock. And he says, you can't see my face. You could only see my back. And we've talked about these verses. Maybe you can't see me in the beginning at the onset, but you can often at the end, put the dots together, connect the dots and realize my presence in your life. But then God comes and he speaks and he tells Moshe and he gives him um, actually in chapter 34, in verse six, I want you to see the 13 attributes and I want you to notice, and I'll do it for you because we don't have so much time. When Moshe is gonna declare God's attributes or God's gonna declare his own attributes, we're not sure, it's a little bit ambiguous. But when that happens and we read the attributes, Hashem, Hashem, Arachum, Bechanun, Erechapayim, Rav Chesed, Be'emet, Nozer Chesed, Lalafim, Nozer Avon, Vapesha, Chata'a, Venakeh. When we read these attributes, and you know when we read them over and over a zillion times? On Yom Kippur. When we read these attributes, which attribute is missing? I'll tell you just to save time. Tzedek. There's no tzedek here. There's no tzedakah in the 13 attributes. And why is that? Maybe because today we started to put together that maybe tzedek by itself could be dangerous. My dad used to say, too good, no good. You have to always have it tempered with something else. Noah, who was an ish sadiq, what happened to him? He kept by the letter of the law, as did Jonah, to the letter of the law. And what is being said here? In forgiveness, after the sin of the golden calf, that word is not going to be here. Because that tzedek, that attribute of being so strict is not going to help us find our redemption. And so I'm sorry that it's so late. So I'm just going to say a few things. We're coming to the Passover holiday. And it doesn't mean that God passed over us in the sense that he passed us up. 
It meant that he passed over us, that he's always constantly over and above us. And if we're going to take one thing away from the Pesach, for the Pesach holiday, or two, number one is I want you to see, and I think it's so beautiful because Moshe plays the role of the leader and Aharon plays the role of the Kohen. So if we're going to channel our inner Aharon, our inner Kohanut, our Mamlechet Kohanim, if we're going to take in our idea of Kohanim, then we're going to be like the Kohen. And we're going to bring people close and we're going to seek them out. And it's even the people who need help and assistance in coming back. And we're going to be gracious and we're going to be great and we're going to let them feel better about themselves. It's not about us being the cedar and them being the hyssop. It's that without the two of us together, we cannot have a purification process. We need the cedar needs the hyssop and this hyssop needs the cedar. We need each other. This Am Yisrael, Arevim Zelazeh, we're connected to each other. That's going to be easily taught to us from the process by which purification takes place in this week's parasha. But if we also want to see how to enter our Pesach holiday, we could learn something from Moshe. And from Moshe, we're going to learn to use our gift of speech, our communicative intelligence. And we're going to be the voice for those of us who can't speak for themselves. And we're going to use our voice. And we're not just going to speak, but as Yashir Moshe, if we start to use our voices to defend the weak and defend those who can't speak for themselves, we're just coming out of a pandemic where so many people couldn't speak. It attacked the lungs. People were on respirators, on ventilators. They could not express a single word. We have to take to, to appreciate. We have to really appreciate the gift that we have of expression and speech and breath and use that not only to speak for ourselves, because me anochi, we have to decide who we are and who we want to be and what expressions we're going to make. And then we have to decide who are we vis-a-vis -vis our humanity, our community, our God. And when we do that, and I pray that we all find that inner voice and we're able to externalize it in a powerful, positive way. When we do that, we don't just bring global healing, but we bring something even greater to the world. And that is song. And we end our seder with song. We start with speech. We start bringing people in. And when we can do that and make space for others to join and we can contract ourselves and we can join ourselves together, the hyssop and the cedar, don't forget those two. When we could do that, you know what the next step is? Not just redemption, not just survival, but a thriving that brings such joy that we're going to get to the point where Az Yashir Moshe, where we're going to sing our own song. Miriam sings her own song. And I'll leave you with this. One of the beautiful things about the song of Miriam is that she brought musical instruments with her. Where, how on earth did she have these instruments in the desert? How is that possible? She planned for the song while she was still in Egypt. On the day of pain and suffering and torture, and extermination, they were still in Egypt. She said, I know the day will come when we will sing. I'm going to Tishak. I'm going to laugh today. I'm going to pack today. I'm going to put my musical instruments in my bag today because I know tomorrow there will be song. And my prayer for all of us, our group, our Zoomers, our community, our nation, is that once again, our world will be filled with song, with joy, with health, with prosperity. I wish you all a beautiful, beautiful holiday. And um, I thank you for joining next week. I don't think there is a class on Thursday, but if we're able to squeeze something in between, we will post it on the um, WhatsApps that go out. Thank you for joining.